Hello everyone, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso. Huge thanks to my patrons on Patreon who make this episode possible, who make this whole podcast possible. So big thanks to you, especially the people whose names are listed in the description to this episode and whose names are on the screen on YouTube. They give significantly, uh, some of them for quite a long time. So thank you to my patrons and uh, thank you to the listener who is not yet a patron but would like to become one by heading to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso and throwing me the equivalent of a cup of coffee once a month. Very appreciated. Um, Anything is something and it all piles up into a sustainable living living income that I can uh, funnel into making more content like this uh, for everyone and in particular yourself. Other options include a one-time PayPal donation. Donation. Thank you to Arun for the uh, wonderfully generous donation of recent. Um, and other options like buying t-shirts on the shop or blotter arts or books. Um, basically anything that you find on the shop. Buying that is also a way to not only support the show financially, but also have some cool swag to show off to your friends and support the show in that sense too. Okay, so onwards into this episode, I am back from my UK tour, which went very well. Uh, Some special cool stuff from Breaking Convention will be coming out in the next episode. Some of you know about it, some of you will have to wait for two more weeks. Uh, But feeling excited about that, feeling excited about interviewing uh, people in the new space which uh, this interview today with Adam Strauss is uh, is one of those interviews that recorded were recorded in the new space. And uh, yeah, I'm feeling excited about it. It's uncharacteristic for me to record an interview and then to release it like days after I uh, recorded it. But we're doing so with the, or I, I guess I'm doing so, with the intention of helping to promote uh, his show that's coming up in Toronto on the 19th of September and the Mapping the Mind conference also in Toronto in September uh, psychedelic conference on the 21st, the Saturday, which he is emceeing. But who is this guy and what's the show about? So Adam Strauss is a comedian and a stage performer uh, who has a show called The Mushroom Cure, which tells the story of him uh, healing from his debilitating OCD uh, with the use of psychedelic substances. The show has been very widely regarded and positively reviewed. It was actually funded by MAPS, uh, and I believe is perhaps still funded by MAPS, Uh, but it's been getting a lot of positive reviews, and the way that Adam articulates uh, his understanding of obsessive compulsive disorder as it manifested in its own life and the role that psychedelics played in helping to essentially regain agency over his life out of that uh, the the you know the stark debilitating obsessive compulsive disorder issues that he was going through is really it's really nice it's very very well put and so i appreciated having this conversation with him and i hope that you will appreciate uh hearing it So that's it for the intro. Please enjoy this episode of Adventures Through the Mind with Adam Strauss, episode 106. I start with a little reluctance to, you know, basically reiterate the same things people can hear on other podcasts. Sure. Um, and yet it seems like it seems uh, necessary in relevance to start by asking you about the mushroom, cu- the mushroom cure about your off Broadway show, which is coming to Toronto. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And I assume we are live now or we are, we are rolling. We're we're in it. We're in it. (laughs) We're in it. All right, cool, cool. Uh, yeah. So, um, well, so the story, um, and the, it's the show itself, it's a completely true story. And the, the gist of it is I had really, really debilitating OCD for, for many, many years, uh, I wasn't born with it. It's interesting because if you look at people with OCD, some report having it from their earliest memories, but it's probably a little bit more common where people develop it slightly later in life, typically in their 20s or 30s. 
Um, I was in my late twenties. Uh, prior to that, I always had a lot of anxiety. Uh, I was actually hospitalized twice for just sort of, I was diagnosed with depression, but at least in the American healthcare system, that's often a catch all diagnosis. Uh, I was never really depressed. It was really anxiety and an, an inability to, um, to manage and work with that anxiety. So, um, but, but didn't have OCD until those are particularly traumatic episode, a heartbreak in my life. And the OCD developed pretty rapidly after that. And I tried everything. Uh, I was on Prozac, Paxil, uh, Zoloft, uh, Effexor, Lamictal, Lexapro, Benzo, Xanax, everything. Nothing helped. I saw, I mean, I was living in New York at the time, which is still primarily my home base. And there's certainly no shortage of OCD specialists here. And, uh, I saw, you know, many highly recommended experts in OCD and nothing really helped. And unfortunately, in my experience, it's not that unusual. Um, I always like to emphasize this because I think certainly typical SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are generally the first, first line pharmacotherapy for OCD, they are effective for some people. But if you really parse the data, it looks like uh, about half of people with OCD have some response to SSRIs. But what qualifies as a response for most of them is only a 25% reduction in symptoms. So most people with OCD are not significantly helped by medication. Therapy is often more effective, but not always. And I fell into the camp of what would be called treatment resistant OCD. Um, and you know, OCD, it's, it tends to be a progressive illness, meaning it just, t it tends to get worse over time. It doesn't tend to spontaneously resolve in the way that depression sometimes can. So I, I've never met anyone who's had OCD as an adult and then reports, yeah, it just kind of went away where I have met some people who reported that with depression. So for me, it was getting worse and worse. Um, it was, I can talk more in a bit uh, about sort of the manifestation of my OCD, but it was really taking over. And then I stumbled across this study to date. It's still the only published study of any psychedelic for OCD. It was out of the university of Arizona. It was a small pilot study, just nine subjects. And it was psilocybin. And they weren't even really testing. It wasn't a long-term, you know, follow-up or anything like that. But the results, if you look at this, it's called safety, efficacy, and tolerability, I think, of OCD. And I don't remember the exact title. But it was uh, not a very lyrical title, but it described the, the experiment pretty well, where they, they gave these nine subjects varying doses of psilocybin. And all of them had a pretty significant remission of symptoms. Now, some of them, it was, you know, a day, a few days, a week, uh, but there was one subject and they didn't do long-term formal follow-up, but they did sort of anecdotally follow up with this one subject who six months later still seemed to be largely symptom-free. Um, so they didn't use the word cure in this, in this research paper, but I read that and it looked to me like someone who was very sick as I was had effectively been cured with psilocybin. And so I decided that, hey, what do I have to lose? Really was my attitude. I didn't have much experience with, um, with psychedelics at that point. Um, but I had desperation and this was, I should say, this was, this started in 2007. So it was a very different climate in terms of the, um, mm -hmm. the general sort of mainstream acceptance or openness to psychedelics as, as a medicine. Uh, I had never heard of anyone who had used psychedelics for personal healing. Um, but yeah, I was, I was desperate. And so that actually the beginning of the show itself is me finding this study, uh, at a particular low point in my life. And, you know, I, I won't go through the whole show. It's a 90 minute show. I don't want to take up all our time. Uh, and of course I want people to buy tickets for Toronto and, and other right, dates, right, right. <laughs> but, but I will say it was not, you know, I looked at it in a very OCD type way. What I mean by that is OCD is characterized often by black and white thinking. So I was like, all right, great. You know, I'll take the right dose of mushrooms in the right setting. I'll have this perfect experience. Uh, I soon found the Hopkins study uh, about mystical experiences, and I kind of put them together and was like, okay, so what I need is this sort of plus four mystical experience to cure me. And it was this very kind of linear, rigid way of thinking about it. Again, right dose, right drug, right setting. I'm going to have the right experience. I'm going to cure myself. And so ironically, it became sort of an obsessive quest for me. It, it almost mm. fed the OCD in some ways. And I went, uh, I, you know, I went down the rabbit hole 
uh, I did a lot of different psychedelics. I discovered the whole world of research chemicals, um, you know, Shul, uh, Sasha Shulgin's whole uh, pharmacopoeia, 2CE, 2CT7, uh, 2CD, uh, 2CB, 4 ac or DMT, literally probably 15 or 20 of those, and was hell-bent on curing myself. And without giving away the ending of the show, um, Ultimately, psychedelics were absolutely very helpful for me, but I wouldn't say I'm cured. OCD is still an issue in my life, but it's much less frequent. And even more importantly, it doesn't take over the same way. So there were times when I would literally spend a week or more holed up in my apartment. I would not leave my apartment. Maybe I'd go out, you know, to get food once or twice. Uh, but I was just totally non-functional in, in, in the throes of the OCD. That doesn't happen anymore. Hmm. When it takes over now, it may be a few hours. Um, it may be a day, but it's even in the midst of it taking over. I, I don't go to the depths I used to go to. Now, one other thing I want to say, because I try to be totally transparent, is it wasn't just psychedelics that helped. In the show, I mean, I think one of the fascinating things about psychedelics is that they seem to open us up to synchronicities or make us aware of maybe synchronicities that are already happening. Um, so other things came into my life that were maybe obliquely caused by my being open to psychedelics, but didn't directly have to do with psychedelics that helped a lot too. And really one of the reasons why I, I decided to, to share this story was a sense of wonder that I have myself about how all these different things sort of came together and it's, you know, kind of the ultimate psychedelic cliche, but I got not what I wanted. I didn't get a complete cure, but I got what I needed, which was a degree of freedom. Um, and I think a, um, an ability to, uh, to maybe in some cases help other people by going through this myself. Mm. So I look at the show, my goal as a performer is to connect to the audience emotionally and entertain them. Like I don't go into the show saying, okay, I want to heal people. I want to enlighten people. I don't have an agenda per se, but having done the show now for seven years, it does seem to have that effect on some people. And that's certainly very motivating for me. Hmm. So th there's, there's a lot there. And I feel like in, 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 you're obviously quite, quite versed in explaining, explaining the show. Um, there's a lot there and sort of like each stage of what you're talking about for me is like another area of investigation. And I, I kind of want to maybe start by focusing in on, um, well, I was going to start by making this comment about the, the term of, uh, treatment resistant, um, mm -hmm. putting the, um, putting the failures of the treatment on the, on the, um, the client's, uh, the client. So it's like the patient, mm -hmm. it's the patient's fault. They're resistant to the treatment rather than the, like the more accurate, which is, uh, ineffective treatment cannot find effective mm -hmm. treatment. Their OCD does not respond to conventional treatments. You know, their OCD does not respond to our treatments as we understand them at this time, rather than putting the, the emphasis of responsibility as to the inefficacy of the treatment on the patient, which I think is just an entirely backwards way of thinking about, um, the treatment of mental illnesses at, at, in any way. I like that. You know, I've never, honestly, I've never heard that before and I've never even thought about it before in those terms, but you're right. It's sort of saying, yeah, this is your problem. This is the problem with your OCD rather than this is a failing in our, in, in our sort of approach to this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an uh, important shift. I think so too. And I, I mean, that is really what opens up a, a greater understanding of, of how we might develop greater treatment protocols rather than just boxing people like yourself over into this place where like, oh, well, they, they, they don't work. They're, they're not, they're not good enough for our treatment or whatever it is. And mm, it's sort of yeah. this like this trash canning away, even if, even if practitioners care about it, there's this, you know, unconscious, um, bias, uh, or sort of stuckness in, in, in the institutional protocols for treatment, um, that, uh, close patients off from actually getting treatment that they might actually have might end up being effective, such as psychedelic therapies. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think, I, you know, I think part of it reflects the fact that, and I think this is one of the reasons why psychedelics are being embraced so rapidly. Uh, I think part of it reflects the fact that a lot of psychiatrists are um, discouraged in their field. 
You know, you look at the the drug development pipeline. There hasn't been a significantly novel medication for OCD or depression in 30 years, over 30 years. That's when the first SSRIs came out. Um, antipsychotics, it's basically the same picture. There's these, you know, new generation antipsychotics that were thought to be more effective. Now we're seeing they're not, and they have all these side effects. So psychiatry as a field, you know, it had all this promise in like the 80s and 90s. And I think a lot of psychiatrists now are, are seeing, yeah, you know, we're our, the tools we have at our disposal are very, very limited and they're very much blunt instruments, you know, mm -hmm. they, they do a whole lot of things. Some of them are beneficial. Some of them aren't beneficial. There's no way to tell who they're going to benefit under what circumstances. So given that context, I think it's understandable, um, if not entirely forgivable that psychiatrists would be like, yeah, you know what? It's kind of on you. We, we, we can't help you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I wonder too about the role that, um, that the pharmaceutical industry plays in the in the ongoing propagation of a paradigm for treatment of mental illness that's firmly situated in a brain not working right must fix mm -hmm. brain physical organ that produces consciousness that produces consciousness is not functioning properly or normally we must have a physical intervention to physically change the physical brain in order for any treatment or any positive effect to come out of it so for example the chemical imbalance theory of depression which is right you know at this point is is fairly well recognized as far as i understand to not be why depression happens like it's yeah. it's not actually a lack of serotonin um and yet it continues to be propagated as as though it's a chemical imbalance issue yeah, that's a that's a particularly nasty one. You know, the the FDA has actually prohibited drug companies for use from using it on their advertising. I don't think they do so much anymore, but for years afterwards, they would still use it and they just pay the fines because it was that effective of a marketing idea. Um, but yeah, there's been there's very liberal, educated, intelligent, medically literate people are still shocked to hear me say this. So I love saying it, and it sounds like you're already familiar, but I'll say it. There has never been any correlation. Uh, any conclusive correlation discovered between any neurotransmitter and any quote unquote mental illness. There are some people with quote unquote low serotonin who are not depressed. There are some people with high serotonin who are depressed. This is the same thing with dopamine and schizophrenia. It started out as a um, justifiable uh, hypothesis, but as we've gotten more actual data, it's just not true. We don't know at a neurochemical level what causes depression, or schizophrenia, or any particular uh, any particular state. And but yeah, it's it's good marketing, and it it's um, and I think there's a comfort in it too, you know. To certainly for me, when I first went on SSRIs, you know, the idea, oh, this will correct an imbalance, that's very appealing. There's something wrong with me. It's the you know, it's like, well, if I, if I'm a diabetic, of course I'm going to take insulin and that's going to fix my problem. Well, I have, must have low serotonin. So I'm going to take, uh, Lexapro and that's going to fix my problem. But unfortunately it's, it's not that simple. And it seems like, you know, another thing I, I love citing, we know significantly more about how LSD affects the brain than any SSRI. And that's a reflection of the fact that LSD was studied for decades first as a potential medicine, but then as something to be demonized. We need to understand how this, you know, this evil drug works in the brain. Whereas SSRIs, to get FDA approval, they're typically doing six to eight week clinical trials. So we have some sense of what it does for six to eight weeks. But the reality is that people typically take these medications. I was on them for 15 years and many people take them for a lifetime. So we don't know what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and there's there's two things there one of which is is how positive it, and and vital it is for someone suffering to recognize um, that it's not their fault uh, that they're suffering mm -hmm. from a mental illness um, as long as it doesn't come with a complete offsetting of personal responsibility towards doing what needs to be done to gather one's life together you know like a recognition that it's not my fault that I'm suffering however it is my responsibility to show up to my life if I want it to get better um, and another part of that is um, is that for some people SSRIs works and is a lifesaver, and that it's it's certainly not a totally defunct medicine. It's just not as hyped up. Um, hype. It's not as effective as it's hyped up to be. 
Yeah, I'm glad you made that point. Absolutely. For some people, that's the perfect word. It is a lifesaver. It makes massive life-changing differences. And the other point uh, I'd be irresponsible not to make, not that I assume anyone will base medical decisions <laughs> based on hearing me, but if you are on SSRIs, SSRI discontinuation syndrome is a real thing. So it's the sort of thing where even if you've made the decision that you want to get off of these, it's something to be done under medical supervision. Um, and also I'd say educate yourself too, because even some psychiatrists, they're just now starting to realize how hard it can be to get off these. And in my case, I tapered off Lexapro over the course of six months and previous attempts to get off in a few weeks or even a couple of months were unsuccessful because of withdrawal effects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, also something to consider, I don't know how it works in the United States, but here in Canada, we have a uh, universal health care uh, you got to throw that on my face, man. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, it's not, just because you don't have to pay for it doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It's certainly better that if I break my leg, I don't have to wonder about whether or not I should set it at home because yeah. I can't afford it. Um, but uh, It seems I, like it's better, but anyway, go on. There, there are obviously problems in it. And for example, it might be my general practitioner who just decides to give me you know, fluoxetine for depression, but they're not a psychiatrist and they don't actually fully understand because they're like general practitioners are just profoundly overloaded with their responsibilities yeah. and the expectations of them in order for them to also fund their life because they don't make a lot. They don't make as much money as someone in private practice because all the funds are institutionalized and there's certain requirements as to they have to diagnose something and prescribe something in order to actually get paid for the time that they mm -hmm. give to a patient. So it's all like, it's huh. very nuanced. So if you're in Canada and a lot of my listeners are, um, it, it might, you know, it might benefit to also see what your actual practitioner, your, your GP's familiarity is with the substance that they are prescribing you before you go through any process of coming off it or even going on it, I suppose. Yeah, and that that is the same in the states. Most um, most psychiatric medication prescriptions, at, at least for SSRIs, this may not be true for antipsychotics, but SSRIs are written by general practitioners here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I, I, I see that you know, no, I'm not trying to throw shade at, at GPs. You know, they've they are playing an important role, and they're and like I said, they're overloaded um, a lot of the time. Uh, they have a lot of expectations that are put on them. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the, the, ra the rampant issues we're seeing with the overprescription of SSRIs is in many ways, I think, caused by the un uninformed prescribing practices of GPs who are ultimately just out there trying to care for their patients um, and going off the, like, the knowledge that they have sort of commonly available to them out of the medical, like the medical treatment culture, which is not necessarily accurately informed in, in the advances of the science and psychiatric medicine. Yeah. And I, I think, right. I, I, and I, and I take the same view here where I think most people are genuinely doing their best. Um, you know, I, I have an uncle who, who's a general practitioner and for him, it comes down to a lot of the problems his patients report, um, are overtly, you know, psychological and a lot of them may be a second order effect, uh, gastrointestinal issues, back pain, stuff like that. But he has to see, I don't know how many patients a day, but you know, you, you get a 15 minute window if you're lucky with a patient. He's actually a very compassionate, intelligent, sensitive person. So given time, I feel like, yeah, in an hour, maybe he could help someone, but in 15 minutes, what can you do? You can write someone a prescription and hope that they're in the, uh, the lucky, you know, subset of people who do respond to this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's that's th those are great points, and 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 it's the whole sort of way we do healthcare um, in the we'll say North American slash Western society right now. Yeah. A lot of amazing advances in medical science um, and the institutions and treatment protocols that are, that are supported by those institutions at this point have a lot of room to grow. And before I move on, I kind of want to throw out the caveat that I don't know about yourself, but I am definitely not a doctor or directly involved in, <laughs> right, in the medical right. culture. So this is a uh, this is like um, bro medicine or whatever. I'm right, just putting that out there for the listeners, obviously. Yeah, for sh for sure. Uh, but and, but what I also would say, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, is even a lot of people. I mean, I think it's incumbent to educate yourself on this stuff because that is, I mean. The internet, it can be a double-edged sword, but certainly I've seen a lot of, you know, in the past I'd seen a lot of quote unquote, not quote unquote, they were experts on OCD or psychopharmacologists who really um, 
who who had limited knowledge uh, and I was able to to find useful information online as well because the fact is you know if you're a diabetic someone can tell you with a high degree of confidence you know yeah insulin is is going to help you but if you're depressed if you have OCD I don't think anyone can say with a high degree of confidence treatment A or treatment B will help you and so exploring different options uh is helpful but yes ultimately there are you know this isn't we're a holistic system and there are side effects, there are medical risks, there's all that stuff. So certainly having a medical professional involved in your care, I think is, is yeah, is critical. No mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A medical professional that you have an ongoing active relationship with in your treatment. Yeah. Though, unfortunately, again, that's, you know, and maybe this is more common in the States for some people, that's just not, not a possibility financially. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's similar here in Canada, unless, unless you've, manage to like somehow pass through unless you have money or you somehow manage to pass through a very lucky series of gates that just happen to be open to you getting a good reliable active like um long-term relationship practitioner to a sp to a specific condition that you have um that's well informed is is hard to find um the stuff that's paid for by we'll just say the the state or the province um is yeah, is, is, is inside of that larger sort of like rotating tour institution. But sometimes for some people you manage to luck out, but for the most part, it's the people who are getting good care, the people who can afford it. And then we can talk about all sorts of structural issues around class and race and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, but maybe we'll, maybe we'll just <laughs> leave, leave that to the side. Um, yeah. And I want to ask you a little bit more about the manifestation of your OCD. Um, and I want to, I want to also, I just feel inclined to bring up this series of novels I read a while back uh, mm -hmm. and spoiler alert to anyone who has not read the Ender series by Orson Scott Card. Um, but in the, the second last, third or fourth book, there's this, they, the, the human race has gone out to occupy like a thousand planets or something over 2000 years or the a hundred worlds over 2000 mm -hmm. years. And what ends up happening is in each specific planet, uh, culture forms for that planet. And so there are planets that are just Norwegian culture, or there are planets that are just like um, Catholics. And they're, you know, so and there's this one planet called Path, and it's essentially just Chinese culture, mm -hmm. sort of ancient Chinese culture. And they have this like, uh, they have this race of people who are considered like the God spoken or something. Um, and I mean, it's pretty clear once you start reading into it, they're extremely intelligent. They're like superhumans, super, super intelligent. Um, but they also, the way that you find out that they're one of the God spoken is that uh, they have these like vicious ticks. And, huh. that the, and that the only way to to make these ticks go away is to do a thing. And for one of the characters, it's to like trace every line of wood grain on the floor until they are, quote, purified by the gods and they can stop what they're doing. And other ones are to do these weird, like, whatever. And they find out later that it was like a, a secret sort of, uh, it was a clandestine operation by like this overarching body to basically breed these superhumans, but to put inside of them as well, a genetic predisposition towards extreme OCD so that, and then to manipulate them into believing that it has to do with the God so they can continuously be controlled because inside of that was, um, inside of that was the assumption that the gods are always speaking on behalf of this larger organization that the superhumans are talking to. So anyways, huh. I'm just always looking for an excuse to talk about this amazing <laughs> novel yeah, yeah. that I thought about. Um, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your OCD and um, yes. and how it manifested in your life. Yes, as one of the gods spoken, I'm happy to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to check that out, even despite the spoiler. Yeah, for me, the OCD, um, it was, and I'm always a little, it's always a, a decision that I have to make about whether to use past or present tense, but I'll, I'll use present tense as well, because again, I, I, I like to be very open about the fact that I'm not entirely cured. I mean, the show is called the mushroom cure. Sometimes people ask about that. Why'd you call it the mushroom cure? Well, because it's the story of me seeking this absolute black or white unequivocal cure. It's a quest essentially. It's also a love story. Um, soon after I read that study, I coincidentally or not met a woman who had inadvertently, um, cured her own 
crippling clinical depression with uh, with cacti, with psychedelic cacti, and she was a psychiatrist, psychologist, and sort of uh, started working with me while we developed a relationship. So there's a lot of threads to the story, but um, but yeah, so the manifestation is primarily around decision making. So to illustrate with sort of an example, I could be choosing, um, the show opens up the mushroom cure. It opens up with me trying to decide on, uh, an MP3 player. This took place years ago before, you know, everyone had iPhones and I was deciding between these two MP3 players and I'd lean towards one. And, and then I would feel like I was making the wrong choice. So basically it's to put it in broader terms, if I'm confronting a decision, um, I'll first think about it a lot, you know, and I could start obsessing about it and it can start, you know, when it was bad, it could really start dominating, just thinking, 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 which is the right MP3 player, which is the right MP3 player doing exhaustive online research, all that stuff. And the more I do that, the more I did that, the more anxious I would get. And finally I'd make a decision. I'd say, all right, I'm getting this MP3 player and I'd feel a little bit of relief for a little bit. Finally, it's over. I can go back to my life. But then I'd start thinking, wait a second, wait a second. No, no, I, I don't know if I made the right choice because the one I didn't choose has slightly better sound quality and I'd get anxious thinking that I'd made the wrong choice. So I'd reverse my choice and I'd feel a little bit of relief. But then I'd think, no, wait, I had it right the first time. And I'd go back and forth, just ping ponging back and forth. And the reason OCD is so powerful is because it works. In the short term, a lot of people with OCD don't realize this. It seems like this bizarre behavior, and it is bizarre, but in the short term, when you engage in your ritual, and I would call my ritual reversing decisions, you feel a little bit of relief. It may last 10 seconds. It may last, if you're lucky, five minutes, but you feel that little hit of relief, and you get addicted to that, so that then, when the anxiety comes back, you think, well, yeah, if I wash my hands again or I change my decision again, I'll get that little hit of relief again, so let me do that. And you go back and forth and back and forth. And meanwhile, there's a sort of meta trend going on in your life, which is you haven't been to work in two days and you might get fired because you've been engaging in this ritual. Um, your spouse or partner may leave you because, you know, they, you, you won't leave the bedroom. And these things cause even more anxiety. And the more anxious you get, the more you want to reach for, I'd call it your drug of choice, this OCD ritual, because it does provide short term relief and you just get trapped. I mean, I look at OCD and this is not novel to me. A lot of people look at it this way now as uh, as an addiction. Hmm. You can define an addiction as an attempt to avoid fear that actually creates more fear, hmm. which in turn drives more of the addictive behavior. So it's this, this quest for certainty, for safety, for relief that actually makes things more uncertain, more unsafe, and ultimately, you know, puts off any possible relief because you're just trapped in this, in this cycle. And, uh, yeah, so that, that, that was how it manifested and to a lesser degree still manifests for me. Mm -hmm. and, and this, in, in the worst of it, how often, how often was this happening for you? Continuous. It, it was continuous. I wouldn't even say continual. I would say continuous because, you know, it's the idea of, uh, people say life is about decisions. I, and, but I'd go a step further. I wouldn't say life is about decisions. Life is decision. I mean, I think that is the mystical, profound, godlike power of being human is that every moment we are making choices, whether we realize it or not. And I was in a state of being hyper aware of even choices that, you know, typically we automate. Should I walk down this side of the street or that side of the street? Um, should I, take a bite of this piece of steak that I've already cut up or that piece of steak. Do I want to save the bigger piece for later? Or I want to chew the bigger piece. Now everything, it was just a constant assault. And, um, yeah, it was, I, I was not living in the world. I was living in OCD for years and years. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. That's very interesting. So, so then I, 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 I got the sense when you're telling the sort of overview of the show that you might be reluctant to talk about what it was specifically about the psychedelics that helped you. Um, but I'm curious if you can comment what, I mean, the outcome seems you have greater affect regulation. And so you're less likely to engage in, you know, like very detrimental intensity of this ritual because you're more able to have an awareness of self-regulating your affect, your anxiety, or your sort of um, mm -hmm. 
your responses to various stimuli so you're less likely to go into the cycle that leads to anxiety that leads to the OCD um, behaviors but what was it about the psychedelic experience what did it offer you experientially that you feel enabled that shift from wherever you were before to where you are now with which is essentially a much greater agency over your life yeah that's a good way to put it it's a good question um and i'm happy to talk about it so the biggest way psychedelics helped me and continue to help me i, I do continue to work with them um albeit in a a more um a more circumspect, less, you know, hell bent, uh, way was really through surrender. So I understood, you know, if you look at OCD again, this attempt to avoid pain that creates more pain. So I understood intellectually that to break it down a little bit more with OCD, but I'd say with pr probably every mental illness, there is some sort of unwanted thought and or physical sensation slash emotion. I mean, I look at emotions as physical sensations. So for me, the unwanted thought was I'm making a mistake. Mm. That thought in turn produced a physical sensation that I would term anxiety or fear. I happen to feel that sensation in the center of my chest where my heart is. Other people may feel it in other places, but that's where I tend to feel emotions. Of course, I had no awareness of feeling emotions in my body prior to psychedelics that helped me a lot with that as well. But, but I understood intellectually before I ever did psychedelics, because I did see a lot of well-meaning and gifted therapists that if I could accept the unwanted thought, just allow it to be there. And if I could, to the extent I had any awareness of it, allow those unwanted emotions to be there, those sensations in my body, I would then free myself from the obligation to engage in these, this compulsive reversing ritual, because the ritual is designed to get rid of the thought and the feeling. So if you accept the thought and the feeling, then there's no reason to do the ritual. I understood that perfectly, but acceptance is such a tricky thing. Mm. It's a mysterious thing. I would say it's, it's almost a profound, it's because you can't understand or think your way to acceptance. For me, I look at acceptance as really, it's more of a body thing. It's a physical thing. It's allowing these sensations to physically be there. It's dropping that physical and maybe at some level spiritual fight, but it's not something you can think your way to. So I was able to think my way to the point of saying, yes, I want to accept, but I was unable, or maybe it was unwilling, but I wasn't able to bridge that gap to actually surrendering at a nonverbal physical level, if that makes sense. And psychedelics, the first time I ever had the experience, you know, it's called the mushroom cure, but as I mentioned, there were a lot of psychedelics I did. It's called the mushroom cure because it was a, the psilocybin study that inspired it. Um, and mushrooms were important as well. But the first time I ever had this experience of visceral surrender was actually on an LSD trip. And I remember it very clearly. I was, I was having this experience and something started happening. It, it was noise from the environment that I really didn't want to be there. And I'd been having this sort of blissful experience. And as soon as that noise came in, I found myself physically and uh, intellectually tensing up. You know, I started thinking about well, this noise shouldn't be there. Why is it here right now when I'm having this experience and th these changes in my body, this sort of fight response. And that had happened to me, you know, with noises, with OCD, with whatever, tens of thousands of times before. But what happened next was different. I was able to separate from the thought and the sensation. I was able to kind of see it without fully identifying with it. And then I was able to choose consciously to allow it to be there, to kind of relax into it. The metaphor that came to me shortly after this experience is, um, if, you, if you've ever taken a bath and you get into the bath and the water, it's a little bit too hot. You kind of get in and then you sort of, it's the same with cold water, but you sort of relax into the initial discomfort. You sort of surrender to it. And that's what it felt like to me, was just allowing my body to surrender to my experience in that moment, which was, yeah, there's a sound I don't want there. And I, and I, I wish it wasn't there. And when I did that, it wasn't like I became one with the sound or embraced it, but the fight went away and there was a peace there. Mm. 
And after that experience, for several days, I had no OCD because when the OCD would come up, when I have a thought, you know, I'm making a mistake, I would do the same thing. I'd see that thought. I'd see the tension in my body and I'd allow it to be there. Unfortunately, that uh, that faded after a few days. And that was part of my journey with psychedelics is having these little openings that then didn't last. And I think part of that was you look at the uh, the studies that they're doing now and integration is a huge part of it. It's not, you know, hey, take the drug and good luck. There's a lot of follow up. And I, I didn't have that. Uh, and I didn't even really understand the importance of that. I mean, again, it's hard to overemphasize how different the climate was. Certainly, there were plenty of people in 2007 who understood, let's call it psychedelic best practices. There were books. There were, you know, people, Stan Groff, Jim Fadiman. But I wasn't even really aware of that stuff. So, um, but that was ultimately how psychedelics helped me is by, in a few, one of the ways was by learning to be present to my experience instead of trying to fix it or change it or get rid of it by going into my head and obsessing. The lie of OCD is that if I change what's going on, I'm gesticulating with my hands, but I realize it may not be in the camera frame. If I, if I fix what's going on out here, if I can get everything on the outside perfect, then I'll feel good on the inside. Hmm. And so, of course, it doesn't work that way. And so it's endless. You try harder and harder to manipulate. First of all, we can't control the outside. We can't even control the inside. Uh, second of all, the outside is endless. So that's the lie. The reality is, if I can be present with what I'm experiencing right now, however painful it may be, I may not feel good. I may not like it, but I will find a degree of peace and freedom because I'm not fighting what is. And that's what the place psychedelics brought me to. And yeah, it's been, it's been a huge shift. Mm, interesting. I know you, uh, I, I believe anyways, I'm correct. You did a show, um, with Shane Moss, who was also recently on the show just before breaking convention in London, yeah. uh, a couple months ago, I sadly missed the show. I was at a leadership summit of some variety. Um, but when I was at breaking convention, the talk that I gave talked about integration and it specifically talked about how the lessons that we get aren't actually the concepts. So one person might hear what you're saying and think, oh, the lesson, the lesson is obviously to accept and to uh, like to be in acceptance with what's happening. Um, but my suggestion is that the lesson was actually that experience, that capacity to accept, not the way that we communicate. The lesson isn't, oh, acceptance isn't the lesson in the sense that acceptance, the word, acceptance, the content, mm -hmm. but acceptance, the lived somatic experience of how to be in acceptance to a moment. And that after a psychedelic, you have that ability to be like, oh, I can just be on this other way of relating to this experience. That was an experiential element. And that afterwards, there's a window of convenience where it's just really easy. Like it just happens. I love that phrase. Yeah. Right. And then that window closes and the window will inevitably close no matter what, but it's during that window of convenience that we, we embrace practices on a, on a narrative level, the metaphor and whatever, but on a deeply experiential neuroplastic level that we engage, reinforce practice and familiarize the lesson, which was that somatic experiential medicine of actually being in acceptance. Um, and, and that that constitutes learning the lesson, that later now that aspect, that ex that capacity is a little bit more available to us because we've sort of like, uh, we're doing we're doing physio or whatever. It's like physiotherapy mm -hmm. for the brain. So I think I, I really appreciate that you, that you pointed to that. Um, and I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, I love that phrase, window of convenience, because there is that window and I, I still fall prey to it where I'm like, oh yeah, I've, I've got this thing licked. Right. Where it does just, <laughs> it feels effortless. But yeah, that then that closes and it does come down to a choice. But yeah, I mean, one way to look at it is I, w once you've kind of, you know, who, who uses this? I think, I think it's Jim Fadiman who uses this metaphor. One, one of the luminaries in the field does the idea of, of, uh, it may not be him, but you know, psychedelics, they can take you to the, um, you, you get to the mountaintop, um, is the idea you get a glimpse of what it's like, but then you still need to figure out how to, how, how to, how to get there, you know, mm -hmm. in, in your daily life. 
and yeah, but it is, it's absolutely an experiential thing. And I'd say now today, the way psychedelics work for me largely is physical, particularly ayahuasca is just reinforcing, um, this, this connection with my body, which is something, you know, I mean, I'd been in therapy for, for decades and I'd never once had a therapist say, what's going on in your body right now? How do you actually feel like the, the question, how do you feel, which I've been asked hundreds of times by therapists at, maybe it was on me, but my interpretation was what thoughts am I having right yeah. now? Yeah. That's common. Super common. Yeah. yeah. Rather than what are the actual sensations in my body that, you know, with OCD and I think probably all mental illness, the thoughts are an attempt to alleviate or manipulate these sensations and it doesn't work. If it worked, we wouldn't have mental illness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Feel, I, I just gave a, while I was in England, I, I did a workshop about uh, interpersonal neurobiology and it was a series of practices. One of the practices was about learning to differentiate between feelings and interpretations where, mm. you know, how are you feeling today? Oh, I'm feeling like life is a real pain in, or uh, what's a, I'm feeling like, uh, like, uh, there's just too much on my plate right now. And I'm, you know, I really don't want to go to this thing tomorrow and blah, blah, blah. It's like, none of those are feelings. Like those, yeah. those are stories. Those are thoughts. Feeling would be like, I'm feeling fatigued. I'm feeling overburdened. I'm feeling some inadequacy. Those are feelings. I'm feeling hot. I'm feeling physically heavy. Those are feelings, um, and I think it's. I, I I love. I love that you pointed to um, the the importance of being able to understand what our feelings are, to be able to feel those feelings, and to be able to understand their sort of role in our in in, in the thought processes that are going on. Yeah, and, and for me, and I consider myself a beginner at feelings. Really, I mean, maybe I'm a, an advanced beginner now, but I'm. You know, this is new to me. Still, relatively new to me. Uh, but there's really, there's two dominant feelings that I try to avoid. And it really, they may be the same. There's, there's fear, which is more of a, uh, future oriented thing. I'm, I'm worried that something is going to happen that I don't want to happen, or I'm going to lose something that I want to keep. And then there's loss, something which is more of a past, you know, looking backward feeling where something happened, I didn't want to happen, or I lost something. And those sensations, which again, for me, I feel in a non-metaphorical way, I feel it in the part of my chest where my heart is located, you know, that the OCD, that that's the foundation the OCD was built on, or I don't like that phrasing. The, the OCD developed as a way, I believe for me to avoid those feelings. Mm. Um, and so what I do now, this is actually a new practice, which actually, uh, was reinforced by a recent LSD trip, um, is when I find myself skittering around, you know, do, being frantic in my head, trying to figure things out, trying to fix things, trying to just tune into what am I feeling? My, my, well, what am I feeling right here? We'll get the visual right here. Really just trying to tune into what's happening there. What are the sensations as, as minutely as I can. And then a neat little thing I've just started doing a few days ago is just going like this, just kind of trying to let them spread, trying to encourage those feelings to, to spread through my body if they want to really giving them permission, not so much in a intellectual way, but in a physical way, letting that sensation spread. And so, and so and, for the listeners, what you're doing is basically you're, you're putting your fingers into the center of your sternum and you're just spreading them out. So your fingers sort of like your, your hand opens to spread your fingers across your, your upper chest. So this, and, and it's interesting too, because that is a part of the whole, um, like the neuroplastic learning, you know, there's the concept, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm spreading this or whatever, but it's, it's actually the physical action and the emotional tone or feeling tone associated to it. That's actually bringing the, bringing the positive impact in, in my, in yes. my opinion, it, it's actually focused more on the somatics than it is about the story we tell ourselves about what it's doing, but that story is necessary as we're also cognitively reasoning creatures as well. Yeah, the story is necessary to get me there, I would say, you know, that's but once but it is the experiential thing. And, um, you know, just even that phrase, follow your heart. I mean, I've heard that my whole life. And, and it's just in recent years, that I, I'm understanding how to apply that literally hmm. to hmm. that there there is I, I more and more I see the heart as a source of data, essentially, 
there's information there. It's not even information, I believe personally, that I have to understand intellectually. I don't have to figure out a story behind it. Oh, I have this feeling because this happened. It's just, I believe that there's a, a rich information there. And to the extent that I'm able to let that in and view it as a gift from the universe, from higher power, however I want to look at it from my deepest self, but view it as this is something that I'm being presented with for my own benefit. And if I want to fight it, it's going to persist and it's going to make things unpleasant. I'm not going to learn what I need to learn, but if I can let it in, um, that's going to give me freedom. And I try to have faith. <laughs> Sometimes I don't that, that it's going to, um, move me in the right direction. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So in a, in another interview, um, I had heard you mention, and you spoke of this earlier that you're that your OCD, um, the symptoms of your, of your OCD didn't come about until, uh, you said your late twenties. And in another interview you pointed to, it had something to do with the separation from a partner, uh, at the time mm -hmm. seemed to be the catalyst event. And you also pointed to like the two main feelings that seem to produce the, the, the level of resistance that creates the anxiety that leads to the OCD being fear and loss. Is that something that you've made the connection to um, in your psychedelic experiences? And is there anything that you have to comment on, on what you've understood about, about that connection that would be helpful for, pe for people listening? Yeah, cer certainly. Psychedelics have been instrumental in, in making that connection for me. Absolutely. And yeah, like you said, I had a particularly significant romantic relationship and, um, it ended to some extent because even though I developed OCD in response, again, there was these, there was building and at times overwhelming anxiety, uh, and symptoms related to that insomnia that really strained that relationship. But yeah, the narrative I subscribe to, and I, I like using that phrase because I feel like we do have a choice as to what narratives we believe. Mm -hmm. And also I think humility is so important. I mean, that's another thing. If you want to talk about the benefits of psychedelics, humility is probably number one on the list, you know? <laughs> Dumb monkey don't know shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, OCD is such arrogance, this belief that, oh yeah, I can figure everything out. I know exactly the way things should go so that my life should be perfect and that the world should be perfect. And just having that shattered on some... so. I should mention this, and that is another benefit of psychedelics is also having overwhelming experiences that, um, and difficult experiences that, that really humbled me, um, has been helpful with the OCD and with being a human in general. Um, but yes, the narrative that I subscribe to rightly or wrongly is that I had this heartbreak. I had no tools or understanding or willingness or all of the above to feel that heartbreak. And so my brain trying to be helpful said, okay, let's just fix everything out here. And that feeling will change. Hmm. Um, so I, that, that's the connection I draw. And sorry, was there another part to your question? I, uh, I mean, that was, it was, you know, have you drawn the connection and, and what could you say about the connection that would be helpful to people listening that are either seeking to understand better OCD in general or your OCD or their own experience of, of OCD um, that might be, it, that might be helpful for you to sort of unpack. Yeah. Um, I think we've touched on some of it. Uh, what could I add? If there's not anything there to add, that, yeah. that's okay too. Yeah. I, I just, just the idea of, um, I, I do believe OCD is, is a strategy a, not a conscious strategy, but a strategy to avoid our experience. Uh, and I do believe that's true of probably depression as well. You know, it's a different strategy, depression. It's, you know, I'm not just not going to get out of bed that to use one stereotypical manifestation. OCD is sort of the opposite. Instead of I'm not going to engage, it's, I'm going to hyper engage and try to fix everything. But ultimately these are attempts to avoid our experience, which is an insane thing because by definition, it's our experience. We can't avoid it. However, I also think it's important to have compassion for ourselves and to understand from an evolutionary perspective, it's not insane because we evolved in an environment where the threats that we were most concerned about were actual mortal threats. We weren't so worried about, um, which MP3 player to choose 50 million years ago. We were worried, is there a uh, saber toothed tiger going to drop out of that tree and kill me? And when you're dealing with external threats, the strategy of control, i.e. depression or avoidance, I mean, control, i.e. OCD or depression, which we could call avoidance, 
So you could also maybe even simplify that to fight or flight. It's a damn good strategy when you're dealing with an actual threat out in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think it's understandable that as over time, we've somewhat mastered these external threats. Um, I don't worry ever really about, I mean, there's certainly many people in the world who do, but I don't worry about harm to my physical person generally. Um, as those are, are mastered and I haven't had to worry, I've been lucky. I haven't had to worry about having enough food or shelter ever in my life really. So I think there's these other threats start to become more predominant. Am I optimizing my life? Am I getting the love I need? Am I doing the, following the right path? Am I, um, you know, eating the right food? Am I having the right sex? All these sort of, those start to become more, more, uh, more dominant and I think it's understandable that we then adopt the same strategy. Okay, let me try to crush this threat or let me try to retreat from this threat. But uh, but yeah, the, it, there's a profound difference between something that's out there and something that's in here in ourselves in that we can't avoid what's, we can't avoid our experience. It, you could, some might say that our experience in fact is all that we are. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I'm not sure where I sit with some of the observations there about depression, but I'm not sure. I, yeah. Here's the place to unpack it necessarily. Um, but there's a couple of things there that I think are maybe interesting to unpack. Um, and one of which has to do with, let's see, I, several things came up. I'm thinking about Slavoj Zizek, uh, in a, in a, he's a, he's a, um, Oh, is he Serbian? I think philosopher often represents a communist philosopher. Although if you really get into his stuff, it's not really all that communist. Uh, and he had a debate with Jordan Peterson, a fairly contentious uh, professor here yeah. in Canada. Um, and whatever Slavoj brought up this, or Zizek, we'll say in the in the honorific way of referring <laughs> to a person like that, uh, brought up the story of Christ and the cross as um, as this. Uh, as this example we have to let ourselves know to give us give us the acknowledgement the compassion to say see this so-called perfect man son of god human life was so difficult the suffering can be so great that even him the perfect man called into question and fell into existential despair that's how heavy mm -hmm. it can be so the fact that you're going there doesn't make you like you're not mm. less by any means, you know, because even the perf the so-called perfect man fell to existential despair in the face of the profound suffering human life can offer. And I want to kind of utilize that as a segue to point to, you know, yeah, okay, so for you it was about the MP3 or it was about crossing the street or whatever, but the but the biological um, intensity. Is, is similar. The, the primal panic that can be logged into the nervous system doesn't differentiate between saber-toothed tiger and the right MP3 player necessarily. That's a cognitive thing. Um, and even, you know, we talked about the limitations of just a cognitive-based approach. Um, and that a lot of these things are, are based in our epigenetics and they're based in our early life experiences. And, um, and, you know, we could have an entirely safe life on the external and still experience deeply unsafe, traumatic, emotional realities because of genetic predisposition and, and early life experiences or the society that we're based in. And so I wonder now, in your psychedelic experiences, especially with psilocybin and, and ayahuasca, you know, my experiences as well as the sort of the observation of the larger repertoire of reports is that oftentimes, um, and of course this is going into psychotherapy in general, oftentimes people tend to be able to track back to experiences early in their life that they otherwise had completely forgotten. Um, even as far back as say, you know, like complications during the birth that don't, that manifest into lifelong, you know, mental illness. Um, in your experiences with the psychedelics, did anything like that come up to you? Does 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 the experience track back further than that late twenties um, breakup? And 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 has those discoveries, if you've made them, how have they contributed to how you navigate the symptoms of your OCD now? Yeah. Well, first of all, I love I, I love that uh, interpretation of the of the Christ the Christ story. I, I, I'd never heard of that before. And yeah, that's beautiful. 
yeah, even he had to, had to be like, what the fuck is going on here? Why are we doing this? Why What's up, Dad? Is Jesus. There a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought we were cool. <laughs> um, and they're right. But then there is also that added layer, right? It's his dad. And even, right, no, no one is spared. No one mm-hmm. is spared. Whatever. And, you know, we can even look at that as uh, even people who come from great parents who can give them a lot of advantages. No, no one is spared suffering. And I think part of that is also, you know, you certainly mentioned epigenetics, early childhood experiences, absolutely. But I think part of it is we have a brain that didn't evolve to look around and be like, oh, look at that lovely bed of flowers. Let me recline in it. We had a brain that looked around and was like, well, shit, what if there's a a rattlesnake in that bed of flowers? You know, it's the, what is it? The negativity bias, I think it's called looking for what could go wrong. The people who you know, our ancestors who looked around and were like, let me lie down in that bed of flowers. Well, they're not our ancestors. They didn't last long enough to propagate their genetic material. So I think part of it is, yeah, as these grosser, um, you know, more obvious threats are, uh, cease to become threats, the brain doesn't say, okay, cool. Now I can relax and recline in the bed of flowers. The brain says, all right, well, now what are the threats I have to worry about? Well, I have to worry about the fact that um, I don't get the recognition I feel I deserve at work, or I have to worry about the fact that um, my teeth aren't white enough. So the brain, the brain, I believe, largely is uh, an organ dedicated to detecting threats and trying to neutralize those threats. Uh, and we live in a society that conflates brain with identity and with self. And that's also part of the value of psychedelics is showing us that, yes, that is a part of our identity, uh, and a necessary part of our identity, but it is not the sum total of who or what we are. Um, in terms of the, um, sorry, your specific question, I got a little, a little, a little long winded there. You want me to, you want me to reiterate it? Yeah. Yeah. So, the, the question part. I, so I, it, it yeah, tracked, well. it tracked, it tracked back to, you know, recognizing that, um, with psychedelics. Um, oh, sorry. Right. Yeah. Early, early experiences that may have, yeah, been, uh, formative. So psychedelics, I, they seem to work somewhat atypically for me. And I attribute this to the fact I was on SSRIs for 15 years. I've been off for over a decade now. But as, as you probably know, but maybe not everyone listening does, uh, SSRIs for many people, they really negate the effects of psychedelics. And in fact, that was my case as well. When I decided to use psychedelics to try to heal the OCD, I was still on SSRIs for my first experience, which was a cactus experience. And I had almost no effects. So that was actually one of the reasons I ultimately got off SSRIs. I've been off SSRIs for a decade. The standard thinking is that, you know, my psychedelic tolerance should return to normal, but it doesn't seem to have done so. I tend to need quite high doses of most psychedelics and even on, you know, like high doses of ayahuasca, I've never had a really intensely visual experience. Hmm. I've gotten some patterning, some closed eye fractals, but I've certainly never had what other people describe as these ayahuasca visions, these immersive kind of dreamlike states where you often it seems like people see scenes from their childhood. And so, as I said earlier, for me, the effect of psychedelics has largely been physical. Having said that, there have certainly been insights, but they've typically been more present moment insights as to how my brain works or a life situation. So I, I haven't had any, any deep past insights and I've looked for them too. There have been times, particularly on ayahuasca, where I've had this sense of, well, often on ayahuasca, I, I get a sense of impending doom. One of the fun, <laughs> fun uh, signatures of that experience, this building fear, particularly in the early stages of the experience. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and my mind will glom onto that and try to figure out, okay, what's causing this? What's what? Why am I? And more than once, I've had the idea of, you know, there's some deep dark childhood secret that you've spent your whole life trying to avoid, and now it's going to come out and it's going to destroy you. My mind will latch onto that narrative. I look at my mind doing that now as, you know, the ego trying to protect itself, saying don't go further into this experience. But I'll give myself credit um, through bitter experience because I've learned if I try to fight those sort of experiences, it turns hellish. I know enough now to maybe not immediately, but fairly quickly be like, okay, well, if there's something there, you know, so be it. Let me, let me see it. That's why I'm here. And there have been quite a few experiences where I've, I've, it's like, 
the metaphor I'd use is like, all right, I'm going to look under the bed. I know there's a monster under the bed. I don't want to look under the bed, but fuck it. I'm going to look under the bed and look under the bed and there's nothing under the bed. I was just scaring the shit out of myself. Uh, I've had that experience on ayahuasca, but also other psychedelics. One of my very, very first trips was a cactus trip on, um, I think it was Peruvian torch. And it was hours of feeling like there was just this terrible thing that would destroy me if I looked at it. And finally, out of exhaustion, cactus trips last a long time. I was like, all right, you know what? I can't fight it anymore. Bring it on. And the sensation, physically, it was the sensation of imagining standing at the edge of a cliff and you're going to step off the edge of the cliff and you're going to plummet a thousand feet. But instead of plummeting a thousand feet, there's a ledge six inches below your feet that catches you. Mm. That's what it physically felt like to me. It felt like the sensation of falling and then immediately being caught. And oh, there's nothing here. I was just scaring myself. I was afraid of my own shadow. Hmm. So I do sometimes wonder, is there some deep childhood material that I've just not been able to access perhaps because um, I don't seem to have those experiences on psychedelics, maybe because of the past SSRI use? I, I don't know. Hmm. Um, I certainly think, you know, there, there's always, you can always go deeper and part of the, um, challenge of trying to engage with psychedelics consciously over long periods of time is learning when to, to probe deeper by doing, you know, higher doses of more psychedelics and learning when to, you know, hang up the phone to use the Alan Watts metaphor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. And that's something yeah, I, I, I still negotiate that. I've certainly, uh, am no expert and it's, you know, it's, there, there are times where, um, yeah, where I feel like I've gone too far in one direction. There have been times where I feel like, wow, you know what? It's I'm overdue for an experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I feel that I feel that too. Actually, I, enough so that I, I feel like I want to comment on it because oftentimes I get asked, you know, like, oh, so how often do you take trips? Are you still doing it this much? Blah blah blah. And there's this expectation that because I'm a you know a psychedelic person that I'm on psychedelics all the time and big psychedelics, but there is a certain level of like. I mean, for some people that's okay, but for someone in my own situation, I have a fairly complicated career that requires a lot of attention uh, co and cognitive, like fairly regulated affect and fairly strongly committed, you know, cognitive presence or allocation and control. And on top of that, I'm an uncle and I play an important role in the, in like the circle of caring for those children, the rearing of those children. And big psychedelic trips don't exactly, you know, that cause me to throw my entire life into question and maybe be dysregulated for days when I make sense of it. Possibly this next one being the one that throws me out of whack for a long period of time. It's just not a cost I'm, I'm, I'm willing to pay uh, in order to just keep going because it's a should in my position or something. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that balance between when it's time for a trip and when it's time to actually just like chop wood and bale water. Um, that's definitely a balance that I walk a lot and mostly on the chop wood, bale water side of things these days. Um, and I, and I also want to comment to that fear at the beginning of the ayahuasca experience for me, it manifests as the, Oh, I've definitely done something wrong and now I'm <laughs> going to die. Oh shit. <laughs> Look what you fucking did to yourself, James. Um, now, uh, I want to also point to, and this will get back into what you're saying. When I heard you describe that cliff metaphor, it seemed very closely related to how you were describing the way that you now regulate with your OCD, which is like, okay, you're standing at the edge of the cliff and it's like, you know, a drop to your death thousands of feet. But when you finally step, it's, it's six inches. It seems like the, you talking about the OCD is the way that you adapt to not feeling these feelings and that it gets really extreme to get away from those feelings. Um, but that when you actually just accept and move into the feelings that it's, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of inferring this from what you're saying that it's like, it's not really actually that bad. Um, it's not as bad as, as the, as the adaptive part of the OCD would claim it to be. It's actually six inches. It's not thousands of feet. Does that connect? Like, does that feel yeah, like you know, it, it does. I hadn't thought about it quite in those terms, but yes. And, and to make the connection a little more specific, I would say instead of feet, it's t or inches, it's time. What I mean by that is when I'm able to, or willing to, because I do have the tools now, thanks largely to psychedelics, um, to connect to my physical experience. So when I'm willing to connect to that experience and feel that loss or that fear, 
it generally passes fairly quickly. It may be, it may feel like a thousand feet for a little bit, but pretty quickly it turns into feeling like six inches and then it turns into feeling, oh, okay, there's some spaciousness here. Mm-hmm. I can breathe here. The feeling is still, um, I, I had this happen uh, on Sunday. I was, I was, uh, I was at a dance party and I was feeling a lot of intense emotion. And I had the thought, oh, well, just dance from that place, feel your heart and dance from that place, kind of dance that around. Like that's, that's along for the ride. Mm -hmm. That's part of, part, part of what, um, part of what's, you know, on the spaceship SS Adam right now is this intense feeling of, of, of loss. And it does tend to pass relatively quickly when I'm willing to do that. The tricky thing is, you know, my ever wily, uh, devious mind will then say, okay, I'm going to open up to this feeling so that I can get rid of it quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's not really acceptance. Acceptance is only an ever, you know, it's as much, it's, I was going to say, it's only an ever unconditional. Maybe we can't make it fully unconditional, but it's really a welcoming it in without conditions, because if you're welcoming it with conditions, you're not welcoming it in. Mm -hmm. And that, that's been a tough lesson for me. And one that, when I'm trying to connect to my physical experience in my heart, I, it's kind of a stage I go through like the first stage. It may be 30 seconds. It may be in the case of this party, I went into the bathroom, <laughs> locked the door, stood there and just tried to breathe into that sensation in my heart. And the first thing was, yeah, breathe it in so that you can get through this, breathe it in so that you can get through this. And then I kind of moved through that into, no, it's, this is here for a reason. It's a gift and I'm going to choose to really embrace it as much as I can. And then, yeah. And then it didn't last that long. Beautiful. Before we, before we, we draw to a close, um, now I haven't seen your show yet. Anyways, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't play where I live for another few more days. Um, but, uh, you talk about having done a lot of different psychedelics was there any particular psychedelics um, or experiences with the psychedelics that you found exacerbated your condition? And if so, um, what was the context that led to that? Was it, you know, was it the context in which you took it, set and setting, um, or was it the specific chemical uh, that seemed to exacerbate whatever the neurobiological underpinnings are? Maybe it's, I mean, we ta- I talked a pretty strong phase towards the experiential, towards the somatic, but obviously neurochemistry is undeniably a part of what's happening there. Is there any particular psychedelic or psychedelic context that you found made things worse for you? Yeah, I love the distinction you made, though, between the chemical and the context. And yes, and I would say it was really the context, not the chemical. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, in fact, I was, uh, I was at Burning Man. I just got back and I had the first ever challenging LSD trip I've ever, I've ever had there. And it was on a quite a low dose. Uh, perhaps that was part of the challenge mm-hmm. I find with psychedelics for me, low doses can often be more challenging than a higher dose where I'm sort of absorbed in the experience. But really this trip, it was the, the context. It was, I, I won't get into all the details, but it was, um, it, it promoted a feeling of isolation and self doubt that, um, is not foreign to me when I'm not tripping by any, by any means, but was certainly heightened and intensified. And, um, I tried to use the tools in my toolbox, which for me, by the way, I'd say a lot of includes physical movement when I'm tripping that can be very helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, vocalizing can be really helpful, growling, shouting. I mean, I'll just do weird shit. I just kind of try to tune into my body and let it go where it wants to go. If I'm in a setting that allows that, and Burning Man, certainly there was, I, I could kind of let, let it rip and uh, yeah, no one really noticed, but um, it led me to a, a fairly dark place and I s- felt, yeah, the obsessiveness and the anxiety were ramped up for some of the next day. And then I kind of worked through it with the support of some friends. I mean, that was the nice thing is I did have, there are integration resources there. Mm -hmm. I had friends who are very knowledgeable and experienced. And one friend in particular kind of sat with me and we talked through some things. And then I had a a really cathartic cry and I, I I felt better. Um, more though. So that's a recent example. The biggest example of something that, that, um, made things worse was 
I had a particularly challenging 2CE trip. I mean, this was 2008, I believe, um, where I was pretty shattered. It was one of these existentially, you know, shattering. I, I The experience in a nutshell was, it was sort of the... Um, the reverse of that kind of oceanic mystical experience where, you know, it's all one and, you know, I'm the whole thing, but everyone is the whole thing. This was this sort of ego mirror image of it where I had this realization. It felt like a realization that I was the only thing that was real. Mm. I'd created the whole universe to distract me from my infinite and eternal loneliness. I had the thought as this trip was happening that maybe I would jump out the window to kill myself. I wasn't I don't think I seriously would have done it, but I had that thought. And then I had the thought, well, I can't die because I'm the force of gravity that will pull me towards the pavement. I'm the pavement I will hit. I'm everything. So I can't ever escape this prison of complete and total isolation and solipsistic um, hell. (laughs) And that experience, four or five hours later, I didn't believe any of it intellectually, but at a visceral level, it had really lodged in deeply. Mm -hmm. And I was shaken in a way I'd never been shaken before or knock on wood since. I just kind of reality felt very shaky. And for months afterwards, the OCD was, was worse. The anxiety was worse. Um, yeah, I was, I was traumatized, I would say. And again, if this happened today, there's all these integration resources, but I had friends who I talked to, uh, my girlfriend, but there was, it was, it, it was tough to get through that. And it took a few months to ultimately what I did was I had the opportunity to, um, get out of the city for about a month and go to a really beautiful secluded oceanfront location. And, um, I did that. And I, at that point I was thinking, I don't know if I'll ever do psychedelics again. However, I did bring some psychedelics with me. So, I mean, part of it was I was subletting my apartment in New York. I didn't want to leave them there, but maybe part in the back of my mind, I was like, well, we'll see how this goes. And about two weeks into that, um, time by the ocean, I decided to do a relatively low dose LSD trip. And I think that was somewhat healing too. It, uh, I, I was able to contextualize the experience a little bit differently, not so much intellectually, but almost more physically. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I certainly get a lot of emails and messages from people who probably haven't seen my show, but they hear the title of the show, the show, they see the word cure, they hear about my story and they, I can tell from their emails, they're looking at this the way I looked at it, which is, this is sort of a, um, a linear path to healing. And it's not that way. You know, one of the incredible things about psychedelics and unique in my experience among other drugs is if I have six beers today and I have six beers tomorrow, I'll probably have a somewhat similar experience set and setting still play a role. But, Mm -hmm. but if I do, you know, if I do six tabs of LSD today or two tabs, you know, versus the same dose of the same batch tomorrow, well, if I do it tomorrow, I probably won't have any right, 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 effects, right. but, but if I have t- the, the same dose of the same psychedelic in the same setting with a seemingly similar mindset that can produce a wildly different experience. So I always emphasize to people, there's no guarantees with this, you know, control for set and setting, know, know what you're ingesting, control what you can control and the odds of having a undesirable outcome are reduced, but I don't think they're ever fully, fully eliminated. And I think that comes back to the humility where these are profoundly powerful, uh, chemicals. And I think their value comes from the fact that we can't control the experience. Certainly for me, a lot of the value has been having these experiences, these overpowering experiences that I can't control where, um, I really have no choice but to surrender without knowing what's going to be on the other side. Hmm. Well, I think that's I think that's a great place to uh, to close out. Uh, Adam, thank you very much for being on the show. Um, why don't you leave us with some links uh, generally to your work, and then end us off uh, with the details of your event in Toronto? Yeah, sure. So, so the Mushroom Cure website is just the mushroomcure dot com. Um, adamstrauss.com has more of my. I, I also do stand up comedy most nights, especially when I'm in New York. So that has more of those dates. Um, my Instagram and Twitter are, are Adam Strauss, but Adam spelled A T O M, uh, A T O M S T R A U S S. Cause someone else got the 
ADAM spellings. Uh, and yeah, in Toronto, I'm super excited. So I'm doing the Mushroom Cure on Thursday, September 19th at 8 p.m. at the Grand Girard Theater. I'll have links. There, there's links on adamstrauss.com and themushroomcure.com to buy tickets to that. I also want to mention there's the Mapping the Mind with Mushrooms conference uh, that Saturday. I guess that would be the 20th in Toronto. And I, I'm, I'm honored. I've never done this before. I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm emceeing that conference and there's a bunch of great speakers, far more knowledgeable than I am on mushrooms, consciousness related topics. That's a full day conference on Saturday, the 20th, also in Toronto. Um, and then, yeah, um, beyond that, I'm, I'm in New York a bunch over the next few months. Then I'll be in the Bay area with a new show in January. And I try to keep the website somewhat updated with all of that stuff. Cool. Um, I think that it's the 21st. Oh, it's 21st. 18th, right? 19th. Wait, wait, you said I, oh, right. I said the the I've been off by a date. Yeah, I was off by a date. Thank you for the correction. Yes. Thursday the 19th is the Mushroom Cure at 8, 8 p.m. And the conference is Saturday the 21st. I believe it starts at 9 a.m., which always strikes me as an ambitious time for a psychedelic conference. <laughs> but <laughs> it'll be the first because I'm hosting it. It'll be the first time I'll ever be there on time for a psychedelic conference. I've intended a lot, but I don't think I've ever made it out much before noon probably <laughs> cool well uh thank you very much for all those links um for convenience sake they will be available to the listener um through the show notes to this episode uh direct links to the mapping the mind conference and the mushroom cure in toronto will also be available wherever you're listening uh be it a pod catcher of some variety or on youtube uh and adam uh you know if the winds of if the winds of uh serendipity are in our favor i will see you in toronto i hope so i hope so thanks so much for chatting with me yeah, yeah i really appreciate it you're welcome thanks for being on the show all right have a good one and cut okay i hope that you enjoyed that episode and uh if you did enjoy it of course share it with your friends awesome we are in the social media techno world now we are a social media civilization in some weird and demented borderline dystopian way actually uh but hey so sharing it on social social media is a great way to support the show as well as perhaps buying some merch from the shop or becoming my patron on patreon so great we're leaving a paypal donation all the options jameswjesso.com forward slash support also, I hope to see you in Toronto uh, in a couple weeks from the release of this episode for uh, Adam's show on the 19th on Thursday in Toronto, as well as the Mapping the Mind conference also happening in Toronto on Saturday the 21st. I'll be there. So um, yeah, if you see me, come by, say hi, uh, as long as there's an appropriate sort of degree of consent verification. I'm super stoked on hugs, so you can come by and give me a hug too. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode, 107, which is going to have some fun breaking convention twist. Ooh, so exciting. Okay, bye.